Greetings, uh, greetings, and welcome to the midweek Bible study for the First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. We're happy that you've joined us, members of the First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church, friends and loved ones who are here uh, to fellowship with us as we prepare to record for our uh, service for Wednesday morning. God is good and he's blessing us continually. Things are moving forward and this evening we're going to be blessed with uh, the same procedure as normal with the song from the praise team, prayer and scripture from the deacons, another song from the praise team, and then Deacon Burns will come to us with the Bible study material, the lesson for this evening. So we are at worship with, at this point. We ask this praise team to come forward and we'll get the activities started. God bless you. Omnipresent. 
He's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun. Oh Lord, you are so great. You're omnipotent. You're my deliverer, my strong tower. There's a name that's above all names. He's worthy to be praised. My heart will sing. How great, how great, how great. He has a name above all names. He's worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great, how great. How great is our God. He's so great. How great is our God. And all will sing He's great. He's great. He's Good evening, First Virginia Avenue Church family. For our scripture reading this evening, I will be reading Psalm 122, and it goes as thus. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions sake, I will now say, peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Such is the reading of the entire Psalm 122. May the Lord have his blessing and a special place in his heart for those who believe in him. Let us bow. Gracious Father, once again, you shine your love on us. Some did not wake up this morning. Some woke up this morning, um, but they acted a fool, not in their right mind. But you made us, Heavenly Father. You know all about us. And before I go any farther, we ask your forgiveness of all of our sins and transgressions against you, Father God, that we walk humbly in your faith and not in sight. We ask your blessing upon our pastor of First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church, Charles. H. Henry Duncan, fill him with continued wisdom. Fill him with the knowledge of understanding that he may direct your people. Bless this church, those who have COVID-19, that they may come out of it. And those who do not want to take their shots, Father God, 
touch their heart, touch their mind, and realize that when they was a child, they had to take shots when before they could go to school. But there's not a difference. But those who are staying away, I understand in a short mind, Father God, but you are the head and not the tail. And Father God, we ask your blessing upon the world as a whole. And Father God, touch the man of God that he's going to break unto us the bread of life. Let him come deep down in the soil of your word, Father God, that he may not be ashamed, but have the courage because there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And we'll give you the glory and we'll give you the honor because it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. And the saints of God said amen and the world said amen that who are watching on YouTube. Amen. building my soul has got to move my soul has got to move my, my soul has got to move there's a leak in this old building y'all and my soul has got to move got another building a building not made Before this time, another year, I may be dead and gone, but before I go, I just want to let you know I'll be living, living in my brand new home. Lord, this old building, it's sinking, y'all, but my soul has got to move. My soul has got to move. My, my, my soul has got to move. This building, yeah, it's sinking, y'all, but my soul has got to move. I've got another building. A building not made by man's hands. hands when I can read my title clear <laughs> to that mansion high in the sky I'll bid farewell to all of my friends God said he'll wipe Wipe, wipe the tears from my eyes. Whoa, this old building. I said it's sinking, y'all. Though my soul has got to move. My soul has got to move. My, my, my soul has got to move. This building, yeah, it's sinking, y'all. But my soul has got to move. Got to move. A building not made by hands. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I'm moving home. I'm moving on. Moving home. I'm moving home. Thank Lord, I'm moving home. I'm moving on. When you hear me singing, yeah. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. When you hear me. Praying to my God, I'm moving home. Said I'm moving home. 
And my soul has got to move. My soul has got to move. My, my soul has got to move. Yeah, yeah. Building is leaking. But my soul has got to move. Got to move to a building. A building not, made not made by, by man's, man's hands. hands. Good afternoon, saints, and all my father's children. We greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And we are here this afternoon to bring you our Bible study for the day, which we're going to be looking at the Sunday school lesson for this coming Sunday taken from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, and then 13 through 15. And the lesson is entitled, Nathan Condemns David. Nathan Condemns David. And the key verse is important. It's Verse 7, it says, Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come as humble as we know how. Lord, we come just thanking you for this day. We thank you also, Lord, for another opportunity to be in the service one more time. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the words that we are about to hear they come from none other than you. And Lord, your word has already told us that I will hide my words in my heart that I may not sin against God. We also know that the wages of sin is death. And Father, we ask dear Heavenly Father as we go forth with this lesson, we hope that it will convict someone that may be holding on to some un confess sins that they will come to realize that if they confess their sins that Jesus he's faithful and just to forgive their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness so Lord we pray that we let the meditation of my heart let the words of my mouth be acceptable in our sight O oh Lord, thy strength and thy redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our verses this afternoon, beginning at verse 1, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeded many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the warfarling man that was coming to him, 
but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he had done this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anoint thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hands of Saul, and I gave thee the master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have given you more unto these such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken the wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword and the children of Ammon. Verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also had put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasions to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme thee, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So as we, as we attempt to look at these verses, one thing that popped out into my mind as I was studying this is that in the day and the time that we live in, money and power goes hand in hand. The more money that you get, the more power that you want. In fact, you have so much money that you think that no one can tell you what to do. No one can challenge you. But God, who sits high and looks low, will pass judgment onto you if you are doing the things that displease him. If we think in terms of the political leaders that have been charged with sexual harassment and only to lie and say that I didn't do it, and women after women coming forth saying that I was raped by this man. Even in the entertainment business, we've had people that actually, that were put behind bars for rape, only to say that I didn't do it. And it's one thing to know that you've done it and try to hide it, but it's another thing to be in denial. And I think that's what was going on in this story about David. So as we get into the, as we get into the lesson, when we think of David, we think shepherd boy. We think a great poet. We think of a giant killer. We think of king. And we also think of ancestor of Jesus Christ. We also think one of the greatest men in the Old Testament, a man after God's own heart. But alongside of that list stands betrayal, a liar, an adulterer, a murderer. But before we become too hard on David, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He was a man who lived with great zest. He sinned many times, but he was quick to confess his sins. His, consen his confessions were from the heart, and his repentance, it was genuine. De David never took God's forgiveness lightly or his blessings for granted. God never held back from David either his forgiveness are the consequences of his action. Like David, during the dark times in our own lives, 
we fall into temptation and allow the devil to use us. One with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. David was human. So here it is, lust in his eyes, adultery, and murder. After restoring the nation to peace and great military power, David's personal life becomes entangled in sin. He commits adultery with Bathsheba, orders her husband in an attempted cover-up. David allowed himself to fall deeper and deeper into sin. Remember, one sin leads to another if we don't confess, repent, and ask God for forgiveness with a sincere heart to return to God for his mercy. David abandoned his purpose by staying home from battle in Jerusalem. He focused on his own desires. When temptation came, he looked into it instead of turning away from it. He sinned deliberately. He tried to cover up his sins by deceiving others. He committed murder to continue to cover up. His sin was exposed. His sins was punished. The consequence of his sin affected many others. Second Samuel 11, 26 and 27 says, and when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And the morning passed. David sent and fetched her to his home, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Also, wicked shall not be unpunished. David's many wives caused him much grief. And as a result of David's sin with Bathsheba, God said that the murder would be a constant threat in your family. He said his family would rebel and someone else would sleep with his wives. All this happened as the prophet Nathan had predict predicted. The consequence of sin affects not only us, but those we love and those we know. When we look at Nathan, whose name means God has given, was a helpful gift from God to David. He served as God's spokesman to David to prove himself a fearless friend and counselor, always willing to speak nothing but the truth, even when he knew great pain would be the result. In confronting David's multiple sins of coveting, theft, adultery, and murder in his affairs with Bathsheba, he was able to help David see his own wrongdoing by showing that he would not tolerate such actions from anyone else. David's repentance allowed Nathan to comfort him with the reality of God's forgiveness and at the same time remind him of the painful consequences his sins would bring. And that's just a little background, so we get into the lesson. And it says that, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. David's sins displeased the Lord. He didn't listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit or to his conscience. God sends the prophet Nathan to speak to David, not with praise, but with rebuke. There were two men in the one city, one rich and one was poor. So Nathan uses a parable of the pet lamb to speak to his friend David. See, David was a little shepherd boy and he caught interest in the story because he once tended a flock of sheep. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle, but the poor man owned nothing but one little lamb that he had brought. The Bible says that he raised a little lamb and it grew up with his children, like a parent bringing a dog or a cat into the house. 
It was common in those days to keep a lamb as a pet. As a pet, It said it ate from the man's own plate and drank from his own cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. This brings to mind when a child is brought into the world or in a loving home that the parents usually feeds this child. They nurture this child, cuddle and show this child love to help it mature. So this little lamb was more than just a little pet. It was like a family member, a daughter, whom he cherished and whom he loved. As the interest grows and Nathan sees he has David's attention, Nathan is about to drop a bombshell on David in this story. Jewish customs was when a guest, expected or unexpected, showed up, you would show some hospitality by preparing a meal. Scripture tells us, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Nathan continues his story. One day a traveler arrived at the home of the rich man. In preparing a meal for the guests, the rich man with more livestock than he ever needed, sheep, cattle, and horses, he takes from this poor man's little lamb and prepares it as a meal. The scene Nathan described is theft. In a sense, the rich man represents David. The poor man represents Uriah and the little lamb, Bathsheba. David stole something from Uriah, his wife. Adultery and sexual immortality are theft, taking something that don't belong to you. And because David was king, Bathsheba couldn't challenge him so this became rape. And if you just allow me to use my sanctified imagination for a minute, I can see King David out on his palace, royal palace, with his robe on, a glass of wine in his hand. And I can see him looking up out in the courtyard. And there's this big tub and this beautiful woman taking a bath. And I can hear him asking, who is that? <laughs> She's fine. And the word comes to him, that's Bathsheba. And he tells him, go get her for me. And he goes and gets her and brings her back to the king. And the king tells her how beautiful she is. And he wines and dines her. And Bathsheba, knowing that the king with such royalty, there was nothing that she could do. And so David insists on laying with Bathsheba. And a song just flashes through my mind that Johnny Taylor used to sing. Who's making love to your old lady while I'm out making love? So David, in a sense, he's lusting for her from the beginning. And then he sends for her and he brings her there. And this is a woman that belongs to another man. And the Bible tells us that we are supposed to get our own wife or our own husband. So in a sense, David knew what he was doing was wrong, but I told you once before that once you have authority, you think no one can tell you what to do. But he forgot about God. So as the story continues, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. David becomes, had become so insensitive to his own sin that he didn't realize he was the villain or the perpetrator. You may discover that in condemning others, you have been condemning yourself. 
As king, David wanted to see this poor man get justice. He wanted the death penalty. It's the fitting for the act, and he says he's found guilty. So David says to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. David showed that we often try to rid our guilty conscience by passing judgment on someone else. David's sense of righteous indignation was so affected by his own guilt that he commanded a death sentence. David had to, commit, had to condemn his own sin before he could find forgiveness. He called God to witness the righteousness of his death sentence upon Nathan's hypothetical rich man. He shall restore fourfold for the lamb. David knew that true repentance mean, meant restitution. Exodus 22 and 1 says, If a man steal an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. David then gives the reason the rich man should pay with his life. And he says, because he had no pity. The rich man has pity for himself and his own possessions, but none for his neighbor. This is exactly David's offense. He took Uriah's wife, also ordered Uriah to be killed, and showed no compassion for him. David was pronouncing his own punishment, not knowing he was the person in the story. In verse seven, Nathan replied to David, you are that man. Through Nathan, <clears throat> the Lord states his case against David. In verse eight, he reminds David of the Lord's goodness to him. He said he gave him everything he possessed and would have gave him more. All he had to do was ask for it. The Lord anointed David king of Israel. He protected him when Saul sought to take his life. He gave him Saul's palace, including his daughter and other wives. He gave him both Israel and Judah. The Lord added, and if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to steal and murder in order to cover sin. David is guilty of all charges. So in verse 9, the Lord asked a question. He asked David, why? Why hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? David had committed two serious sins. He had forgotten the Lord's goodness and all that the Lord had given him plus would have given him more, and David had disrespect, disrespected the Lord's commandment, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill. This was the same sin that Saul committed that forced the Lord to take the kingdom from him and give it to David. David showed no regard for the Lord's commandment by co committing, by coveting, committing adultery, bearing false witness, and committing murder. But God won't allow David to blame anyone or anything else. So David's punishment in the verses that are not stated, in verse 10 through 12, it says, because David had Uriah murdered and stole his wife, murder would be a constant threat in his family. His household rebelled against him. His wife was given to another in public view to lie with. His first child by Bathsheba would die. The Lord said, you did your deed secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel so they can see. Oftentimes what's done in the dark will truly come to life. So in verse 13, David, he confesses to Nathan, he said, I have sinned against God. Then Nathan replied to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. 
and you will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt, in this manner, the son born to you will die. And I know you're probably saying, well, what does this lesson all mean to us? Well, first of all, when we are guilty of sin, we have to confess that we have sinned against God. We have to come with a sincere heart, a contrite heart, and we have to repent and ask God for forgiveness, and God will set us back on the right road. If we don't confess our sins and repent, we will continue, continue, sin after sin. And you might say, well, his sin is bigger than my sin. All I do is smoke a cigarette every now and then. He drinks and he gambles. He commits adultery, he steals, he lies. Sin is sin. And sin is disconnection from God. And in order for us to be restored back to God, we have to ask for God's forgiveness. And David wrote this beautiful psalm when he confessed it. It said in Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Verse 14, it says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O Lord, thy God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall renew forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So the next time that we sin, and it'll happen, ask God, for forgiveness, but before we ask God for forgiveness, let us confess. And by confessing, we acknowledge to God that we've done wrong. We are telling God, you know, and I'm in agreement with you that I've done this wrong. I'm confessing my sins. I am repenting. I want to be restored to the joy of my salvation. And I want you to cleanse me, purge me, and make me clean again. So be grateful for the things that God has given you. Sometimes when we are not satisfied with the gifts that God gives us, and it says that every good and perfect gift comes from God, the same God that give it, the same God that can take it away. So don't never allow yourself to say that you are dissatisfied with any gift that God gives to you. In closing, I thank God for this opportunity to bring the lesson. It weighed heavy on my heart. And oftentimes, we point the finger at other people, not realizing there's three fingers pointing back at us. So we are not here to judge anybody. There's only one true judge, and that is Jesus Christ. Just remember that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is our lesson for today.
Jesus took me in. makes everything all right. We want to thank Deacon Burns for doing a great job with that lesson where we've received the message uh, concerning the true following through of Christ with what the word says. The consequences and the result of sin is death. Someone died, but it wasn't the perpetrator originally, which was David. The baby died. But yet and still we see and we have the message there of the true gospel. And the gospel here, I think we can truly indicate or recognize and receive is simply this. Christ in my place or Christ in your place. And what I mean by that is even though David did not die himself, he didn't pay all the prices for the sins he committed. There were consequences but then there was death, then and later, 
because the sins that were piled on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was, was some of those sins that David committed, some of the sins that you and I commit. And Jesus died for those things. And we want to thank Deacon Burns for doing a great job with uh, that lesson and bringing it to us tonight. Amen. Thank you, uh, Brother Lewis Lipscomb, the, our director of music here at West Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, the minister of music that's loyal and faithful each week to come and support us in all that takes place. And for these men that have been here to sing, representing the praise team with the music for tonight, we thank you as well. And for all of you that hear the message as it's presented, we ask and trust that you receive the message of God, apply to your life, and remember that there's a consequence for sin. The gospel of God, the gospel is that Jesus pays the price instead of us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this another opportunity that we've had to come and worship and serve you and to study your holy word. We pray, almighty God, that through the songs that have been sung, the scriptures that were read, uh, the prayers that were offered, the lesson that was exegeted, the presentations through song, music, and prayer might be something that will resonate in our minds throughout the week, giving us strength and courage to carry on and to move forward, to do your will and to do it your way. For we know, Father, that you love us and we know that we love you and it's because you first loved us. Have mercy on us and grant unto us the peace and love that only you can provide. And we'll forever give you the praise and the thanks shall be thine. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, the communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us until we meet again. It's in the powerful name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior, your only begotten Son, that we pray. And the group sings. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church say